welcome to the, to the History and Future of Dark Matter uh, Symposium. Thanks uh, for waking up so early on a Sunday morning <laughs> and, uh, and be here. We're all very excited uh, for this, uh, you know, fantastic program. There are, you know, some of the best speakers uh, we could uh, hope for uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this symposium. Uh, what I would like to do uh, in this, uh, like, 25 minutes is basically to um, introduce a little bit the subject, especially for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the dark matter problem. And uh, I will try to give you an idea of what we're going to discuss today and what the content of the various talks uh, is going to be. And I will step down because it's uh, difficult to see the, the slides uh, from up there. Um, so let me start um, you know, easy with something we can uh, um, you know, e easily uh, figure this is the night sky. Some of you who are familiar with this will recognize uh, you know, the Orion constellation up here and the bright star uh, here, which you can Im immediately identify uh, if you see the constellation of Orion, is Sirius. So we start this discussion of the dark universe from uh, you know, the brightest star uh, in, in the sky. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that in uh, uh, almost two centuries ago, like 170 years ago, Frederick Bessel, you know, the famous astronomer and mathematician, he was looking uh, at the, uh, he was studying the, the, the proper motion, as it is called, of, uh, of Sirius, that is the, the motion of Sirius with respect uh, to the other stars in the sky. And he realized that uh, his proper motion was very peculiar. So we know that, you know, all stars actually do have a proper motion, but the particular proper motion of Sirius was quite odd in the sense it was not, you know, linearly moving with respect to the other stars. It was sort of, you know, wobbling, going back and forth. And what he suggested was that um, actually Sirius was part of a, a double star system. There was a dark companion, as we would call it uh, in, uh, in um, like modern uh, jargon. And uh, he concludes this, uh, this article that you actually can find, uh, can find on, uh, uh, on this uh, website, the NASA ADS website. He concludes by saying that if we were to regard uh, Sirius and, and also Proton, actually who are studying two stars, as double stars, their change of motion would not surprise us. This is one of the first um, times in the history of, uh, of science where uh, the existence of uh, uh, a dark and unseen body, celestial body, was suggested, was proposed in order to explain some gravitational anomalies uh, in the motion of observed uh, astrophysical objects. He also says something interesting, uh, I, I think particularly the, 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 my, my colleagues will appreciate that. He says that uh, light is no real property of mass, so this is the, the, basically the mass to light ratio concept that we use today. The existence of numberless visible stars can prove nothing against the evidence of numberless invisible ones. Okay, so it's almost uh, you know obvious if we think about it today. Uh, you know, when we see when we look up uh, at the sky, you know there are some um, stars that we can see, but there are also you know it's easy to imagine that there are many stars that are even too dim, either too dim or too far uh, to be observed. And, uh, uh, but, but, you know, starting from uh, uh, the, the 19th century, people have tried uh, to put this, you know, sort of obvious statement on more solid ground. And uh, the big discovery of the uh, 20th century is that uh, not only uh, there are many objects which we cannot see, but there, are, uh, there is a form of matter out there that is substantially, well, it's, it's uh, you know, fundamentally different from anything we've ever observed uh, with our telescopes. Uh, and uh, uh, just to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, you, you, you're aware of this, you know, the companion star uh, of Sirius, Sirius B, was actually discovered, you know, 20 years later, uh, in 1862, and we know now that this is a white dwarf, so it's actually a very compact star, very dim, and, uh, uh, you know, was already back in 1862, uh, it was possible to observe them, and this is, uh, sorry, an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, of Sirius A and its companion star, Sirius B. Now, uh, the usual um, example, when we think about dark matter, um, uh, and you know, if you look at various introductions that have been uh, uh, made of, uh, to, to the concept of dark matter, uh, many cite uh, the example of uh, planets of the solar system, the outer planets of the solar system. They were discovered through the effect they had 
unobserved known planets. So in particular, in uh, uh, 1846, astronomers like Urban Le Verrier and uh, John Couch Adams, they were observing the orbit of um, uh, Uranus. And uh, you know, not only they could, so this, this is a, um, a more a complex problem than uh, you know, the two body problem of Sirius A and B, but these astronomers already had uh, you know, very good control of uh, you know, sort of perturbation theory, let's call it, in, in, uh, um, uh, in the solar system. So they could describe a system with uh, a star at the center and many massive objects uh, orbiting around, them, around it. And they could predict uh, the orbit of every, every planet. And uh, in particular, in 1846, they realized that the orbit of one of those planets was actually off. And the question was, uh, uh, what is that is producing this uh, uh, perturbation in, uh, in the orbit? And their calculations were uh, you know, so much under control that they were you know, really confident that the calculations were right. And uh, uh, they suggested, uh, people like Louverrier, for instance, they predicted the position and uh, the mass of another planet that would perturb the orbit of Uranus and match the observed, uh, its observed orbit. So he suggested the existence of this planet, and uh, you know, the year, uh, one year later, after this planet was discovered, uh, it's Neptune, and um, you know, the, the, it was discovered precisely like uh, you know, one degree off uh, the predicted position, uh, the position that uh, Le Verrier had predicted. And uh, Francois Arago, uh, who was the director of the uh, uh, observatory uh, of Paris, famously said that uh, Monsieur Le Verrier saw the new planet at the tip of his pen, uh, without any other instrument than the strength of his calculations. Okay. The problem is that um, you know a few years later there was another anomaly was observed in the motion of Mercury, you know the innermost planet uh, in the solar system. And the same uh, Le Verrier, uh, you know, since he, was, he had this successful prediction of a planet, you know, an outer uh, solar system planet, he predicted the existence of a new planet that would perturb the orbit of, uh, of Mercury. And he even, you know, dubbed uh, the new planet, he gave it, gave it a name, Vulcan. And uh, uh, as, it, as it turns out, uh, you know, the planet was really never observed. Actually, the, the actual story is that the planet was observed by a number of, uh, uh, like, amateur uh, astronomers. Uh, but, you know, all these uh, observations, I mean, the, the, there was never a, like a robust observation of the existence of this planet. And in fact, we had to await for Einstein's theory of, of general relativity to explain um, the motion of Mercury. So in the first case, we have an example of a gravitational anomaly that, ha that was eventually um, solved through the introduction of a new form of matter, so a new, a new planet. In this case, we have another uh, gravitational anomaly that was solved through, uh, you know, more refined laws of gravity. Okay? We believe to, that we are in, uh, in, uh, in, in the case of dark matter that we'll introduce in a, in a moment, we believe we are most likely in the first um, scenario. We have a, a number of observations that make us, uh, us think that, but unless, uh, until we find uh, th this form of matter, uh, that additional form of matter, dark matter uh, in the universe, we cannot be sure that um, uh, our explanation or interpretation of the data is correct. And this is maybe something that we can discuss uh, during the, the round tables today. Um, okay, so let me now go uh, through, uh, let me just fast forward to the 1970s, uh, because this is one of the subjects we will discuss in some detail uh, today, uh, and that we'll do that to introduce the modern concept of, of dark matter. So this is a galaxy, and you know, if you if you ask an astronomer to think about a galaxy uh, until the 1970s, he would think something like that. So basically, a disk of stars and gas rotating uh, in a disk-like shape. In the case of spiral galaxies, and uh, um, you know, the similar, uh, you know, a similar formalism that we have discussed uh, in the case of uh, of planets can be introduced in the case of uh, of galaxies. So in particular, you can ask what is, um, you know, based on the uh, Newton's uh, law, uh, we can ask uh, what is the circular velocity of stars and gas around the system like a galaxy, okay? So we can calculate what is the circular velocity of stars and gas as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy. And a, there is a very, you know, straightforward prediction that you can make uh, that uh, the, the velocity will depend on uh, um, uh, Newton's constant, 
and then uh, uh, the mass enclosed within the radius r divided by the radius r. So in particular, when you go outside uh, the disk, so you suppose that you know, all the mass is concentrated in a single point, as it is approximately in the solar system, you would expect this mass to be constant. You would expect the velocity to go like one over square root of the distance. And this is precisely the type of um, the decay of the uh, uh, circular velocity that you observe in the solar system. Now, you can ask what happens in a galaxy. And what happens in a galaxy is basically that, uh, you know, since all the mass is not concentrated in a point, but it's, you know, extend, it's an extended object, you would uh, uh, naively uh, imagine that if you measure the circular velocity as a function of distance, the circular velocity would go up, reflecting the fact that the mass contained within it, the radius r goes up, and then that you would observe this one over square root of r decline. But when people started to perform measurements uh, of these um, rotation curves, what they observed was something very different. So this was the predicted curve. This is how the data uh, looked like. And uh, I will not discuss that too much because this is the subject of uh, uh, the, the presentation of Albert Bosma, who will speak at 11 a.m. And Albert Bosma was actually one of the, of the pioneers of the measurements of rotation curves. It was very influential in establishing uh, the existence of uh, you know, a large amount of dark matter in the outer parts of uh, uh, galaxies. Uh, what became uh, clear by the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, was that not only astrophysics was pointing towards the existence of large amounts of matter in the universe, much, you know, a, a lot more mass than we thought was out there, but we started to have uh, um, all sorts of interesting data from cosmology uh, that pointed to the, uh, you know, the, the shocking fact that all the matter we uh, are familiar with was basically, is basically uh, amounts only to 15% uh, of the total matter budget of the universe. And 85% is in the form of dark matter. So something which is not just like an additional form of matter out there, but something which is substantially different from anything we've ever observed. And one of the most important uh, people, one of the pioneers who um, you know, helped bring together information from astrophysics and cosmology and come up with this idea of, uh, of uh, dark matter, in particular cold dark matter, was Jim Peebles, who was picked right after, uh, um, after me at 9.30. Right, so uh, the, um, what people st started to do around the 1980s was to try and, uh, uh, and, and figure out whether we had all the ingredients uh, you know, supposing that there is dark matter out there, whether we have all the ingredients to describe the universe we live in. And in order to do that, um, they started to run numerical simulations of the universe, so structures in the universe. And in particular, they've run numerical simulations with different types of dark matter. So they've run simulations with uh, so-called hot dark matter and with so-called so cold dark matter. And this is important because, as I was saying, uh, dark matter must be very different from anything we've uh, uh, measured uh, and observed so far. But one of the outstanding questions was, for instance, could dark matter be made of neutrinos, you know, the standard model neutrinos? And uh, uh, simulations performed uh, in the 80s uh, actually pointed uh, to, um, uh, a, a, towards a, a very special type of uh, dark matter candidates, cold dark matter candidates, and it became clear that neutrinos were not a good solution for the dark matter problem in the universe. And one of the people who um, you know, played an instrumental role in establishing uh, the cold dark matter paradigm was Simon White, who we speak this afternoon in particular about uh, the um, 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 you know, numeric, well, let's say about numerical simulations in general. Uh, so I've mentioned a number of uh, uh, you know historical developments in in, uh, uh, in in a very short time, but this is actually the topic of uh, a roundtable uh, that will take place uh, at the end of the morning session. That will be chaired by Jeroen van Donken, who's the professor of history at the University of Amsterdam and uh, co-organized. Uh, this symposium with me today. Okay, so then you can ask, uh, all right, so you ruled out, um, as we will see more in detail during the various presentations, so we ruled out, you know, standard forms of matter, uh, like matter made of uh, bari baryons, so like protons, electrons, and stuff like that, and uh, neutrinos. You can ask what is, um, 
what is left, basically. And uh, you can ask in particular, what are the properties uh, of the dark matter particle? I mean, do, what do we know about the nature of dark matter uh, particles? And this is like a 10-point test that new particles have to pass in order to be considered viable dark matter candidates. It would take us a bit too long uh, to go through all the, um, the points of this, uh, of this test. But basically, uh, when it, it, it became clear in the 80s that no, among the particles uh, of the standard model, the particles we are familiar with, there was no particle that could satisfy all these constraints. Uh, in particular, it was hard to find particles that were cold, uh, that were neutral, that were consistent with all astrophysical observations. Um, and one particular class of candidates that emerged naturally from um, uh, the requirement of, in particular, this, the, the, the first requirement of this test, the fact that this particle should be produced in the right amount in the early universe, is the class of candidates that goes under the name of weakly interacting massive particles. And the idea, we will see this in more detail uh, later on today, is that there are dark matter particles in the early universe which are in uh, chemical, kinetic, and um, um, thermal equilibrium uh, with particles of the, uh, with, with every other particle, in particular particles of the standard model uh, in the universe through an annihilation process. So dark matter particles annihilate into particles of the standard model and this process can go both ways and they're kept in equilibrium this way. And um, this is particularly interesting because, uh, you know, particle physicists, so th this came out as a sort of a requirement by studying how much of dark matter there is in the universe and how we could, we could produce this dark matter in the universe. Uh, but in the 80s, the connection was made to specific um, extensions of the standard model of particle physics that theorists were studying for completely different reasons. Okay, so there were particle physicists who were studying extensions of the standard model, you know, with theories like supersymmetry, for instance, and they were suggesting the existence of new particles um, that might be uh, accessible uh, with uh, new accelerators or other uh, type of experiments. And it was realized that these particles are actually uh, could, uh, that, that, you know, these theories actually predicted the existence of weakly interacting massive particles that could um, explain the dark matter universe, uh, in the universe without making ad hoc assumptions uh, about the theory. And at 10 a.m., um, Michael Turner uh, will tell us uh, about the, uh, specifically about the connection between dark matter and the development in particle physics. Um, in the last uh, five minutes, let me just mention that there are a number of uh, searchers that are currently in place, uh, colliders, direct detection, and uh, indirect detection. And uh, the, we will discuss the searches in the afternoon session. Uh, let me just flash this map of uh, experiments worldwide that aim uh, to search for, uh, for, for dark matter, or at least that, you know, is, they are such that dark matter is among uh, the aims of the experiment. Uh, all the red dots that you see scattered uh, everywhere, basically, on the planet is, uh, are dedicated dark matter experiments, the red detection experiments, and you see that there are actually, uh, uh, these are the, the, the red dots show the location of underground laboratories, and in each of these underground laboratories there are a number uh, of these experiments. There are gamma ray telescopes that are providing very interesting uh, constraints. There are colliders. Uh, until recently, there was Tevatron uh, at Fermilab. Now there is uh, the Large Hadron Collider uh, in Geneva. Uh, the, uh, we'll discuss in particular two types of searches this afternoon. One is the, the class of uh, indirect searches, indirect dark matter searches, that are based uh, on the very same uh, process that can lead to the production of dark matter in the right amount in the early universe. This is the, which is the, specifically the annihilation process. And um, uh, basically, the idea is that even if this annihilation, does not, uh, annihilation process does not happen anymore on average in the universe, if you look at the center of very dense structures, like the center of our own Milky Way, then you can uh, uh, still have a sizable amount of uh, uh, annihilation events happening there. Then you can search for the secondary particles produced in these annihilation um, uh, events. And in particular, you can predict a gamma ray signal, for instance, the number of photons that you would expect from the center of the galaxy, uh, the number of uh, you know, antimatter particles that we produce there, and so on. 
And um, uh, Joe Silk, uh, who's one of the pioneers of this field, will sp speak specifically about the history and um, uh, the status of um, indirect searches at 2.30 in the afternoon. And uh, just let me mention also this uh, recent result. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, a little movie that was produced by uh, NASA uh, when they made a press release um, uh, a couple of months ago. And this shows the, center, uh, the region towards the center of the galaxy. And there's a claim uh, that there is an excess emission uh, towards the center of, uh, of the galaxy observed in, uh, in gamma rays. And this is one of the you know, most interesting um, recent results uh, in the field, because this excess emission could be due uh, to, the dark to dark matter annihilation. And we will discuss uh, this afternoon, in particular in the round table, we will discuss about the possible nature of this excess and its possible connection with dark matter. And in particular, we will discuss with Dan Hooper, who's among the people who you know, made this uh, um, uh, discovery, uh, the, the discovered this excess emission towards the center of the galaxy. We will discuss what is the status of, uh, um, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of, of this claim, basically, of the possible connection with dark matter. Uh, lastly, let me mention direct detection searches. So direct searches for dark matter. In principle, these are, uh, you know, they can be described uh, in a very simple way. The idea is to build a detector and to wait for dark matter particles, who, you know, continuously stream uh, through the Earth and through us, um, wait uh, until one of these particles scatters off the one of the nuclei in your detector. And what you want to measure is the recoil energy, so the energy uh, imparted by dark matter particles on a nucleus. In, uh, in your detector and to measure this recoil energy here. And there are many techniques that have been proposed to measure uh, this recoil energy. And different experiments you, you typically you may make use of um, um, different combinations of these uh, um, uh, detection strategies. Uh, let me skip this because this will be discussed uh, in detail uh, this afternoon by Bernard Sadoulet, who in um, the 1980s actually was one of the pioneers of the, uh, of the red detection searches. Okay, it's time for me uh, to uh, stop and uh, leave the stage to, um, uh, to the, 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 the speakers, uh, the other speakers. Let me just mention for those of you who are into social media that uh, a number of people are actually live tweeting uh, this event. This is the official hashtag of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, the event uh, on Twitter. If you don't know what that is, you just can just safely ignore that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, but if you're if you're into social media, there are uh, you know these people who are actually uh, probably live tweeting uh, during the day, and let me you know take also this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the support of um, uh, the Grappa Institute, the Gravitational Astroparticle Physics in Amsterdam, the Delta Institute of Theoretical Physics, and the European Research Council for uh, supporting this um, event uh, today. And let me uh, stop here. Uh, let me just mention that you're invited. Uh, to join the debate. So if you have uh, uh, questions, uh, you, you, know, there will, you can ask technical questions at the end of each talk. You know, typically, there will be you know, short questions that can be answered with a you know, yes or no, or in, in one or two minutes. Uh, for longer discussions, we have, uh, uh, as you know, two round tables, one at the end of the morning session, one at the end of the afternoon session, that will be moderated by uh, the chairs. So feel free to join us for, uh, for that. And um, I wish you a stimulating dark matter day, and I look forward to today's presentations and roundtables. Thank you.